Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are really trusting God. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world, so that all who put their trust in me will no longer wander in the darkness. I have come to save the world and not to judge it. I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again, again, again.
resurrected Savior. So join us as we sing.
Pilate laid open Jesus' back with a leaded whip, and the soldiers made a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and robed him in royal purple. They mocked, Hail, King of the Jews! Crucify him, crucify him, crucify, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him.
Well, welcome to church. And happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. On the count of three, let's give God the biggest praise. One, two, three, come on. Oh, we bless you today, Jesus. What a powerful day it is in the house of God. Would you give the band, the collective, the singers a huge thank you? The Bible says that we're supposed to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I think they did a good job helping us to get into his presence today. And we so appreciate that so, so, so much. Well, I want to welcome you. My name is Pastor Eddie, and we are so glad that you are here uh, with my wife and uh, our team that works all week to put these things together, uh, and then a, the dream team that you ran into as you come through the doors, as you meet them in the parking lot. Those of you who dropped your children off, we have people that serve. This is the dream team that's up here. We can't do it without the team that's here during the week. Can't do it without the dream team. Those are just members of the church that decided we want to serve and make sure the house happens. Would you give them a big thank you for all that they've done? to make this happen this weekend. This is actually service number six this weekend. And so you're here for the culmination of our Easter Sunday. And we are certainly glad that you are here. Why don't you look at the person next to you and tell them how good their hair looks today. Come on, tell them. This is a perfect hair day for you. And you may be seated. And if they don't have any hair, tell them how good their head looks. Amen. So how many of you in this room would say that you're familiar with the term having the patience of Job? Is anybody familiar with that term? If you're not familiar with that term, it's because you have no patience and no one has ever said it to you. But that is a term about a man in the Bible named Job. And there's a book in the Bible called Job. And he went through some real hardship in his life. And he demonstrated throughout the book his patience in trusting God. How many of you know the story of Job? How many of you have heard the story of Job? Well, when you begin the book of Job, in the first chapter, we find Job who has a beautiful wife. He has older children that seem to be semi-successful. They live on property that he owns. He owns many, 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 many acres. He has all sorts of agriculture. He has livestock. He has people that work the land for him. He has much success. He has plenty of money. He's a man of influence. He has good health. And on top of that, he is also a godly man. I've always found that interesting about Job because the book of Job chronologically is the oldest book in the Bible. It is not the first book in the Bible. The first book is the book of Genesis. The first five books are called the Pentateuch and they were written by Moses. But you would think that Genesis is the oldest since it begins with in the beginning. But the truth is, Job is actually the chronologically oldest book in the Bible. And I've always wondered, how did Job know God? Because we know God through the New Testament, don't we? We know God because of the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ that that led us to God. So I've always wondered, how did he know God? But we know that he was a godly man. And in one 24-hour period, he lost everything I just described to you. He lost his kids, he lost his property, he lost his servants. Everything changed in one quick swoop. And after this, we find Job. In Job chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, Job was sitting on a pile of ashes where he was mourning his losses and his wife said to him. So we know he didn't lose his wife among other things that he had lost. Are you still holding on to your faith? Why don't you just curse God and die? Well, there are two things I take away from the scripture. The first one is we know he's a man of faith. Because even in the midst of his worst day, his worst struggle, he's still holding on to his what? His faith. The second thing is of everything that died, I'm trying to figure out how his wife made it out after an attitude like that. But I'm going to move on past that thought. I've had times in my life where it was kind of like Job. Seemed like everything was going my way. You know, things were positive and and, and I just felt really good. As a matter of fact, have you ever been to the place where it's like that and you don't want to breathe and mess it up? Because 
You can wake up the next morning or the next week and all of a sudden it changes. Maybe not like Job faced where he lost everything, but it's like you step out of the shower and it's like, what happened between the time I was in the shower and the time I got out? How did the bad news start rolling in? Has anybody ever faced moments like that in your life where it just seemed like things just vanish? Life might be good for you right now. You might be in this room and you might be saying, I'm riding on some very good things. Or you might be in this room and you could say, it's been a long time since I can remember anything good. I'm pushing through life. I'm smiling. I'm doing what I have to do. But the truth is, I don't remember when good times have been for me, at least in recent history. So here was Job's response to his situation. Why is a man allowed to be born if God is only going to give him a hopeless life of uselessness and frustration. It's funny how that could be the oldest book in the Bible written even before Genesis was, and I think he's speaking on behalf of us in April 2023. Many people walk through life thinking, what's the purpose? So if if Job is saying, what's the purpose in being born if we're just going to live hopeless and useless and frustrated? I'm like, exactly. My question would be, if there is a God, what's his problem anyway? Why don't we all just get to live equal? Why don't we all just have the same money and not have to deal with death? And why is it that way? Well, one thing Job didn't understand that we understand, he didn't understand that there was an enemy named the devil. That wasn't revealed until later. So he was going through life knowing there was a God, but he thought both good and bad came from God. But the truth is only good can come from God and only bad comes from the devil. My doctrine is straight. I can get your doctrine straight about God and the devil. If it's good, it's from God. If it's bad, it's from the devil. So if you're going along in life and things are good, who did it come from? If you're going along and things are bad, who did it come from? And I'm not talking about your husband or wife. You've got to work that out. I'm talking about situations, circumstances that change just like Job's did, and we all know what that feels like. Some of you will remember back in the early 1990s. Now, when I say that, I realize there are some of you in here that weren't even born then, so whatever. Let the rest of us remember. We began to see on television these these commercials about this new magical groundbreaking idea of getting and receiving information and they were calling it the information superhighway. Does anybody remember those commercials? And I was like, what is this? I'm 25, newly married, don't have kids. It was and, and they were really bad 1990s graphics that they were using to make it look all spacey. And we know it as what? The, the internet. The internet came in the 90s. And when it first came out, there were 5 billion people on the planet, basically, at that time in 1992. And only 20 million of the 5 billion had access to the internet. And the majority of them was in the United States. A lot of the countries outside of the United States didn't have access to the Internet. Man, that is a, you realize that's a minuscule number compared to 5 billion. Well, we fast forward to today. There are almost 8 billion people on the earth today. And 5 billion people have access to the Internet. So a whole lot more people have access to the internet. What does that tell us? People are more connected today than they have ever been in the history of the world. Yet, loneliness, depression, and anxiety are at their highest numbers in the history of the world. What does that mean? We are more connected than ever, but at the same time, we feel disconnected. What did Job say? Why is a man allowed to be born if God is only going to give him a hopeless life of uselessness and frustration? Now, I realize that this could sound a little depressing for an Easter message. But you stick with me and we'll see exactly what God does in his word to deal with hopelessness. So my title for this Easter weekend, 2023, has been From Hopeless to Hopeful. 
The world's best minds have given us satellites that orbit the Earth. Satellites have given us cell phone technology. Out of cell phone technology, we found connectiveness. And the next thing you know, they started burying millions of miles of fiber cable so we could get high-speed Internet. Can anybody say dial-up? Now we have fiber optic cable. We can get things lightning fast into our homes, which has given birth to Wi-Fi and to Bluetooth co connectivity. But at the same time, we're the most disconnected in history. It is hard to see how we can be so connected. Some of you literally have 2,000 friends on Facebook and you know three of them. But you keep liking everybody's Facebook so that you can say you have friends. But the truth is, you're not connected to any of them. I don't know if you know the truth is that a person really only has two or three really close friends that they can speak to. Come on. I've always wondered about those that want to speak to everybody on the Internet and they put all of their stuff on the Internet. I'm trying to figure out they need friends. Come on, somebody. They need real friends that they can speak to privately. People are more fearful and they struggle. We have a whole generation right now that looks in the mirror is struggling with their identity. They don't even know who they are. And this is an amazing question. They don't even know what they are. It's becoming somewhat of an epidemic, at least on the news. But right in the middle of all of this depressing news I'm giving you on this Easter Sunday morning, Right in the middle of all of this hopelessness, do you realize there's the message of Jesus Christ? And the message of Jesus Christ takes hopelessness and turns it into hope. And that is why the church exists. It is why we, the church, the Christians are on the planet because we are here to represent what God can do in somebody's life. I have a question for you. How many of you would say in here, God has turned some things around for you? Come on, how, where are you? You are the answer to the hopelessness that's in the world. Jesus was the one who was raised from the dead. The story of Easter begins just the way I began this message, depressed. Jesus being hung on a cross and being crucified openly in front of the whole world. The scripture tells us that Jesus was between two professional thieves. So we're going to pick this up over in the book of Luke in chapter 23. It says two criminals were also crucified on crosses with him. Jesus was in the middle. I'd like everybody to read that yellow in the count of three. One, two, three. Jesus was in the middle. And the other two were on his left and on his right side, I think we know the picture of the crucifixion. We understand the three crosses. It was in our, our title logo up here. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us while you're at it. This guy is in the most hopeless state of his life. Jesus is in the most hopeless state of his life. The other criminal is in the most hopeless state of their life. They're being openly displayed before the whole world and they're dying for hours on this cross. How many of you have ever been in a hopeless, tough, tight situation and you started saying things that you knew you were going to regret later because of your circumstance? And I believe this is what was happening. He was literally mocking God while he was dying. The other criminal on the other side said, don't you even fear God when you're dying? Now, how many of you know he must, must have recognized who Jesus was? Something happened in that criminal's heart when he was that close to that cross. He saw something next to him he had never seen, even in hopelessness. We deserve to die for our evil deeds. See, he's admitting his sin. But this man hasn't done one thing wrong. He's admitting his innocence. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Those were the next words that came out of his mouth. In the midst of his darkest, deep hopelessness, 
He takes one more stab before he's about to breathe his last breath. How many of you know this was a good opportunity for him to get things right? He recognized Jesus as innocent. He confessed his sin by saying, we've done things wrong. And then he said to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, I know that when I'm done breathing my breath on this earth, there's something on the other side of the curtain of life. And when you come into that kingdom, I'm asking you, I'm a sinner right up to the moment I'm hanging on this cross and I'm asking you to do something about my hopelessness. And look at what Jesus says. Today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say next week. He didn't say a month from now. He didn't say you'll have to pay for your sins for a little while in death. He said, I'm the one. I'm life and I'm giving you forgiveness even right now while I'm in the midst of hopelessness. The Bible says that God is the God of all hope. And even while Jesus hung on the cross, he was the centerpiece of hope for the sinner. I never thought about this until I was putting this message together. No one had ever been forgiven by the blood of Jesus up to that point because his blood had not been shed. And in real time, this was the first sinner to be forgiven while the blood flowed. Talk about reality TV. Jesus forgave that man of his sin instantly and said, when was he going to be in paradise? What day? Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was an innocent person. This is Peter. He was one of the 12. He was Jesus's right hand man when Jesus was on the earth and he traveled for three and a half years. Peter was the closest disciple to Jesus, and he said he was an innocent person, but he suffered for guilty people so he could do what? Bring us to God. My first point on this Easter morning is you can't keep an innocent man down. And so I kind of twisted a little statement that probably you're familiar with. How do you know the statement goes, you can't keep a good man down? But the truth is you beat a good man enough, you can get him down. That's the truth. A good man usually can rise, but if you, you, you take away too much from him, more than likely he's going to end up down. The reason why I put the word innocent is because all three men on those crosses died, including Jesus. All three were lowered and pulled off the crosses. All three were wrapped up and put in graves. And all three laid there for three days. But Jesus was no ordinary man. His innocence wasn't like somebody who may have been mistaken for stealing a car. Many people have been mistaken for something they didn't do, maybe because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they looked like or had the same type of clothing, right? And so when they're found innocent, how many of you know they might have been found innocent for that crime, but how many of you know they're still guilty of something? You know, some people, stuff like that happens and they think of all the bad things they've done and they're thinking, I didn't do this, but this is karma. You know, all the things I got away with and finally it's caught up with me on the thing I didn't do. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? What am I trying to show you? Every one of us is guilty. See, Jesus was innocent in a different way. He was innocent in that he had never sinned. Look what it says here. Peter. He never sinned, but he suffered for us while he carried who? Our sins in his body on the cross. He was unlike anyone who had ever lived before, and he was unlike anyone who ever will live after him. He was completely lifelong innocent from anything called sin. You can't keep an innocent man down. You can't take the type of innocence that we're talking about and bury it in the grave because of other men's and women's sins and leave it there because that innocence is going to rise again. Luke chapter 24 and verse 1 says, but the very early on Sunday morning, they took the ointments to the tomb. Jesus has died on the cross. He's been laid in the grave, but early on Sunday morning, it's why we gather on Sundays. It's why we gather on Sunday to celebrate Easter. These are the ladies 
who had been there to lay him to rest on Friday, but Passover kept them from being able to continue to embalm his body. They come on early on Sunday morning. My mama always taught me about the women in the Bible because my mom was all about girl power. And she said, you realize, honey, that, that these, were, these ladies went out before the sun came up and they were walking in the dark to a graveyard where dead people were, to embalm a body. She said, you don't see no man doing that. The women got there first, and look what happened. They found that the huge stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside. So they went in, but the Lord's body was, it was gone. They knew he was dead. They saw him die on the cross. They saw that he was beaten to a pulp. They saw his blood drain from his body. They saw his lifeless body be wrapped up in grave clothes. They saw him laid in the tomb. They saw the stone rolled. They saw the Roman soldiers posted in front of the grave. They saw they put a wax seal all the way around that stone so that if anybody broke it, they would know. They sealed that tomb so he could never get out. But boy, were they surprised on Sunday morning because they found out he was gone and they stood they're puzzled trying to think about what could have happened to Jesus. Suddenly, two men appeared before them clothed in shining robes so bright their eyes were dazzled. That was kind of how it was when I met my wife, but let's move on. The women were terrified and bowed low before them. Then the men asked, why are you looking in a tomb for somebody who is alive? He isn't here. Come on, everybody read it on the count of three. One, two, three. What? Okay, I want you to read it so loud that hell shakes. One, two, three. Come on, somebody. Jesus has come back to life again. Because he was innocent. He's come back to life again. I've stood right in front of the historical tomb in Israel. I've been right where this door is and on that door it says, he's not here for he is risen. Millions of people for the last 128 years, that's how long the garden tomb has been opened to visit. Millions of people all around the earth, tens of millions of people have gone to go see this tomb. And do you know that every person that's gone there has found it empty every time. It doesn't matter what season it is, it's still empty. They wanted to see for themselves what it may have felt like 2,000 years ago. Now look, I stood here, I've even preached in this garden to people, a whole crew of people. Matter of fact, I got preaching so loud one time, there were other people, that other people in other places started coming over because I was preaching so loud. I was preaching so loud one time, I ended up in the newspaper. I say, if you preach loud, you end up in the newspaper. I have no idea if this is the actual tomb he was laid in. But I know tens of millions of people have gone there to try to experience what it might have been like at that time 2,000 years ago. But I can tell you this, whether it is or it isn't, if it's even close to the same place, it doesn't matter because wherever the tomb is that Jesus was laid in, it is empty. Whether I know where it is or not, his bones are not there. You go to Muhammad's tomb, his bones are still there. You go to Buddha's tomb, his bones are still there. You go to George Washington's tomb right down the road here, his bones are still there. But wherever they buried Jesus, I'm here to tell you, it is empty. These women came in the morning when it was dark to embalm a body. They were hopeless, but how many of you know they left with hope? They went from hopelessness to hopeful. There's another account after Jesus rose from the dead and he began to show himself. He first showed himself to his disciples after he showed himself to the ladies. And he began to show himself to multitudes of people. But there's one account where there were two men walking on the road. The Bible calls it the road to Emmaus, a city called Emmaus. 
And Jesus comes up behind these men and they're talking about their depression and how dark of a day it is because the man they believed in, they were one of the disciples, not one of the disciples we know, but one of the followers, the hundreds of thousands of followers Jesus had in that day. And they were depressed because the man that they thought was going to restore the kingdom of Israel, the man that they thought had come from God had been crucified by the Roman soldiers and put in a grave and they were depressed. And he overheard their conversation, so he joined in. He was eavesdropping on them. So he walked up and joined in on the conversation and began to tell them from the scriptures the prediction about himself, but they didn't know it was him. He was explaining these things had to happen. Basically, he was saying this, you can't keep an innocent man down. So we're going to find them now coming into... Emmaus, when they came into Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he was going to go on ahead. Whenever I read things in the Bible like this, I just put myself there. Jesus is so cool. He's like, hey, guys, good talking to you. Got to go. But there was something about him that they recognized, but they didn't know what it was. They said, you know, it's getting dark. Why don't you come and stay with us? So he went ahead with their invitation. After he took his seat at the table with them, it's almost like he's reliving the Last Supper. He took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But then he disappeared from their sight. I've had two prayers for this weekend, Easter weekend. My first one has been that as the scriptures are told and as the stories are told, people's eyes will be open to who he is. When he disappeared, how many of you know they knew for sure it was J.C.? Scriptures go on to say this. They said to each other, they recollected, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? Can you see that they went from hopeless to hopeful? And they were saying to themselves, wow, we, we felt something on the road that was changing us. Another passage says it this, another translation says it this way. Do you remember the warm feeling we had on the inside while he was telling us about the scriptures? My second prayer this weekend is that people's hearts will be lit on fire for the resurrection of Jesus. So number one, you can't keep an innocent man down. Number two, you too can be innocent. We just described somebody who might have been accused for stealing something they didn't steal, but they have been found innocent, only innocent for that one thing. But when I say you too or I too can be innocent, we certainly know that we're not innocent people. Every one of us knows ourselves what we've done and we know where we have been lawbreakers according to the scriptures and the laws of God. Romans chapter 3 clarifies, all have sinned and are not good enough. Why don't you look at the person next to you and say, you're just not good enough. Go on, tell them. Just tell them, you're just not good enough. There are husbands avoiding this at all costs right now. They're, they're laser focused. Preacher, just preach the word. Don't get me in trouble. The Bible says, how many have sinned? How many? This is a room full of sinners and are not good enough. I love what Jesus did for us. But all are made right with God by his grace. There's nothing you can do to fix your problem when it comes to spiritual issues. But Jesus traded places with you and me. And the same way that he forgave the, the, the thief on the cross is the same way that he'll forgive you. It doesn't matter what you've done. God has power to forgive you. But you have to humble yourself. You have to be, see, there were two thieves. Matter of fact, let's name them. There's no names for the thieves on the cross. Let's give them names. We'll call this one pride and we'll call this one humility. What does pride do? Pride says, I don't need a savior. Pride mocks God and says there is no religion and there is no God. But what does humility do? It bows its knee and says, I'm no good without you. And what is Jesus' answer to humility today? When? Today. Psalms 37, 
verifies our innocence. Commit your way to the Lord. See, this is your part. Commit your way to the Lord. That is your part. Trust him. That is your second part. And he will help and forgive you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn. He will give you something you can't give yourself. Innocence. I don't know about you, but you ever take a a vacation to the beach? Pay for the hotel? Get beach front hotel, you know, it's more expensive, or beach view hotel, you know, you, yeah, I see it, <laughs> right? When you pay for that kind of vacation, there's nothing like the sunrise on the beach. And if you're not an early riser, you will drag yourself out of bed because you're paying to see that sun come up on that water. But when you see that come up, that, that vision of the sun coming up on the water, there's nothing like it. And God said, he'll make your innocence radiate like the dawn. Only he can solve your problems. God forgives you and me in spite of our guilt. It's called justification. See, God is just, and because he's just, he can justify you. The definition of justification is... It's a legal declaration from God that you are innocent of sin. Not because you've made yourself right, but because he has made us right. I just want to remind you again of what Job said. Why is a man allowed to be born if God is only going to give him a hopeless life of uselessness and frustration? Job didn't understand the forgiveness of Jesus. The world is so full of hopelessness, they're saying these types of things. But then we come over to the, probably one of the most famous scriptures that have ever been penned or quoted. John chapter three and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, I love the whoever, Because it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter your language. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. It doesn't matter if you come from the woods or the mountains or the water. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. The next scripture is really, for me, the key scripture. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, the innocent one who took on our sin, once he rose from the dead, he didn't come back and say, now look what I did for you. He came back and he said, look what I did for you. You're guilty. And I want you to know, I'm going to make you innocent like the dawn. I want you to take just a few minutes and turn your eyes to the screen. I want to show you a video of a couple who attend this church and show you a modern day example of God's goodness in people's lives who are not perfect. Let's watch. I grew up in a Christian household. As I hit my teenage years and early 20s, I got rebellious and walked away from the faith. I was raised Catholic and I had a very strict grandma. Uh, Every Sunday, we'd go to church. When I came to Virginia, I didn't have my grandma with me, and I really didn't have anyone to steer me faithfully. We had our son out of wedlock. As we grew more serious in our relationship, we said, hey, let's start looking for a house because our family got a little bigger. I said, hey, our closing's at 5 p.m. Are you off that day? He said, I am. And I said, great. Um, do you want to get married? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But um, when we got married, we didn't have any kind of fate. We went through some rough patches in our lives. You know, bad habits and uh, things that just got in the way. My wife's cousin uh, attended here at Summit, and she would always uh, invite Leslie. You know, we kind of brush it off and say thanks for the invitation. Invite, but you know, we're just not gonna go. Generationally, I guess we had 
a strong addiction to alcohol. My father at 36 years of age died from alcoholism. My sister and I came to live with our mother and unfortunately she also was battling um, alcoholism. I had lost a parent. I needed a parent and I had no one. I just never had a really responsible relationship with alcohol and I started becoming who I didn't want to be. I was exposed to, you know, sexually explicit content online and as most teenagers I got hooked on it. But it was something that inevitably, you know, caused a rift between me and my wife. And when I did try and I could feel that those thoughts still come in, that's when I realized that it's it's kind of out of my control. I thought, well, what's the one thing I've never actually, you know, put my time into and is actually learning about Jesus Christ. Like I didn't even know where to start. I just started in Genesis. I couldn't even really understand, but I thought if I just try something, like something will click. Thanksgiving was a tough holiday. I had made a fool out of myself in front of my family members. I turned to my cousin Melissa and I said, I have nothing to lose. I have everything to gain. And I came to summit with her. I had never went to a church like that. It was like I felt home. When I heard Pastor Eddie's message that day, I just remember being very moved. I made the decision. I shot my hand right up and I said, this is the day where I'm giving myself a new life. I watched it on Facebook. I felt something tell me, just let go. Whatever is holding you back, let it go. And when I did, I just, I, I couldn't describe it at the time, but I felt something wash over me. Um, and I cried there in, in, in my living room. I'm happy to say I've been sober for 51 days and counting, living my life in sobriety and with Jesus Christ and with God and my family at my side has really made me value the life that I want to live and the life that I know I can live. I do feel like I'm living in victory. I feel like my connection to my wife is the strongest it's ever been. I learned what it means to hand it over to Jesus. I feel safe because of it. Like I truly do. And I just feel like I've been blessed my whole life. Like, you know, I have a good job. I was able to meet her. We have like a a true love. My son is very sweet. He's got so much love in him. God really has blessed me, even though I walked away. You know, he never left my side. And so, you know, it's the best decision that I've made is to, you know, turn my life over to Jesus. Is there anybody in here that would testify that the best decision you made was to turn your life over to Jesus? You know, when I hear that couple, Felix and Leslie, you know, all I hear is each one of our stories. Maybe not identical, but every one of us are sinners. And without the grace of God. But do you realize that their lives have gone from hopelessness to hopeful because of a decision? One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible concerning forgiveness is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God will forgive us. I want you to understand that the only reason that we carry sin is because of pride. Do you remember pride on the cross? But do you remember humility? He confessed his sin. The difference between somebody who's hardened in their heart and somebody who has softened their life is the one who's willing to admit it. I'm a sinner and I need God. I'm lost without him. It says if we confess our sin, God will forgive us. We can trust God to do this. He always does what's right. He will make us clean from all the wrong things we have done. 
There's nothing you've done that God can't deal with. You're not so broken that God can't put you back together again better than before you were broke because he's the creator. He's the master of the universe and he's the forgiver of humanity. So number one, you can't keep an innocent man down. Number two, you too can be innocent. And my last point, is you can't pay your own debt. Financial debt on the earth can be overwhelming and it can be debilitating. I would say that the majority of people in here probably understand what it probably means at some time in your life to be in over your head financially. Realizing that that what you have and what needs to be done, what you have is not going to meet it, and maybe we start living on credit. And now we dig ourselves a deeper hole, and we get in this financial cycle, and we just try to act numb about it and just go to work and try our best to get through life. We have classes here that we can actually teach you how to manage your money better and to get out of debt completely. Since we started those classes, we have actually taken hundreds of families through those classes and we've canceled millions of dollars of debt on one side and millions of dollars have been saved that people never had in the bank before because they changed the way they managed their money. We've cut up hundreds and hundreds of credit cards so that they started living by their means. Well, that is one way to feel better about yourself, but that is natural debt. Spiritual debt is much more dangerous because spiritual debt has an impact eternally. Spiritual debt, you cannot cancel your own spiritual debt through management of money on the earth. Every one of us has spiritual debt. And we cannot pay it back. But the Bible tells us that God sent Jesus to pay our debt. He canceled the payment that was due for your and my sins. Instead, God accepted the payment of his son that Jesus provided when he died on the cross. Full proof of that payment was three days later when he rose from the dead. When he died, he, he said these words. He said, it is finished. When he rose from the dead, he said, I'm back. And he came back to enforce what he said that he would do. Colossians Chapter 2 says this, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. If you go to a restaurant and you order a meal, maybe today you you got some some idea of ordering some food after this, or maybe you've already purchased food and you're going to cook it. When you go through the grocery store and you fill up that cart, when you go to the counter, how many of you know you're legally in debt for what's in that and you have to pay for it? When you eat food at a restaurant, you're legally in debt for what you've already eaten. How many of you love it when somebody comes by and pays for it? Food tastes a whole lot better at that point. Because they paid for your legal indebtedness naturally. Jesus paid for your legal indebtedness spiritually. You are in debt to hell for your sin. But Jesus came, not only died, but rose from the dead to pay your debt. Which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. How did he do it? By nailing it to the cross. Without Easter, there's no salvation. Without Easter, there is no forgiveness. Without Easter, there's no healing. And without Easter, there is no supernatural provision. Andrew Murray said this, a dead Christ, I must do everything for. A living Christ does everything for me. Price has been paid. The only thing that we as humanity have to do is humble ourselves like 
humility did on the cross and confess, I'm a sinner. You're the innocent one. Remember me. Forgive me. And Jesus said, when? Today. Oh, but God, I would be lost. I was buried beneath my rebellion, lost without hope of redemption, blind to my need for a savior. Oh, by God, crushed by the inspired and encouraged you. Thank you for your financial support that allows Summit to bless this community for Christ. If you'd like to give to Summit Church, click the Give link in the description box.